You're listening to the Veterinary Innovation Podcast. You're listening to the Veterinary Innovation Podcast. My name is Sean Wilkie, and along with my awesome co-host, we interview the innovators in this space every week. Excited to welcome a friend this week. Ivan, please go ahead and get us started. Hey, I'm Ivan Zag. I am excited to introduce Debbie Boone. Uh, she's well known as our industry, and she has worked for veterinary profession for more than 35 years as a manager, consultant, writer, and a speaker. She enjoys using her expertise to improve workplace culture and the well-being of veterinary professionals. Debbie hosts The Bend, a podcast that invites guests to share stories of managing unexpected change. Her latest literary creation, Hospitality in Healthcare, is now available at all major booksellers. That's the book that she wrote, and we're excited to talk about this today. I'm so excited to see you again. I think we met a long time ago, and you've been driving this uh, veterinary industry and community with from different angles. Tell us a little more about this book, The Hospitality in Healthcare. What is it about, and why people should read it? Uh, well, thanks guys for having me on, and you're right. You know, we did meet a long time ago when you were in, invented SmartFlow. And of course, uh, Sean and I know each other because without Talkatu, I could not have written this book. So I'm going to put a plug in for Talkatu. So the book is called Hospitality and Healthcare. And what it talks about is utilizing skills that I grew up with to make life better in a veterinary practice. I grew up in the in the restaurant business. My family I always laugh and pick on my mom that you were firm believers in child labor. So they started us at a very young age working in the business. But I learned to serve the public at a very young age and did it really my whole life. So I understand that between learning good communication skills, understanding a little neuroscience about how people's mind works and bringing in hospitality, what we can do in the veteran hospital is head off a lot of client conflict, which is causing a great deal of anxiety in our practices. We, since the pandemic particularly, People seem to have ramped up negative behavior, and I've had practice managers say I've fired more clients in the last two years than they have in the last 20. Well, our goal is not to fire clients. It's not good for business, except for some of those people who we really, really do need to, client, to get rid of. But, but for the most part, a lot of times it is just poor communication that is causing people to be upset, and that is a lack of training. And so if we are teaching our team members to be better at hospitality, understand communication skills, understand people's emotional intelligence in their own, then we can solve a lot of the issues that we have. And, and hospitality is not just client facing, it's hospitality internally, because we are also serving each other in that team and being better uh, and giving each other a little more grace as we work through our day. That's super fascinating. Uh, Debbie, this is not the first time we've had a conversation about hospitality in veterinary medicine and hospitality workers coming into veterinary medicine. It's, it's really kind of an interesting kind of thought process. Why do you think that hospitality workers specifically are great inside a veterinary hospital? Well, you know, I can tell you that we have a community of scientists who come into work in veterinary hospital and they're very animal focused. In fact, over the years, I have hired a multitude of people and interviewed thousands more who have said to me, I came to veterinary medicine because I don't like humans and I did not want to go into human medicine. And then they're shocked that they get into this business and find out that it really is a human business and medicine is the product that we sell. So when we bring in hospitality workers who are used to working with the public and managing challenging situations, uh, understanding how to serve people well, especially like if you're thinking about waitresses, you know, I grew up, as I said, when I first started, I was running the cash register and taking payment. And then I started to be the hostess and then I started to wait on tables. Well, when you're a server, you get direct customer feedback because if you do the job well, people leave you good tips. If you do it poorly, you're going to starve. So it, it's kind of this training that happens as you learn to be better and more effective and more efficient. And one of the things I used to train people when I was training wait staff is think before you move because you can walk yourself to death. And you, I, I watch this because once you know it, you can't unknow it. And so I sit in a restaurant and I watch poorly trained servers 
run to get water and then come back to the table and then run to go get a ticket and come back to the table and then run to get a salad and come back to the table and run to get dessert and come back to the table when they could have made one loop and serve that efficiently and serve their customers better. So in veterinary medicine, the reason that we use hospitality workers or that they're they're so efficient, I used to love to hire waitresses front desk, is they are understanding the front facing challenges of dealing with even hungry people, that hangry thing is real. So hungry people, they understand uh, immediate feedback from giving good service and what works and what doesn't work. And they're also very efficient in movement because you can't waste time. We have very few bodies in veterinary medicine now. Um, there's always shortages of staff. So let me be the most efficient I can be and plan how I'm gonna move, how I'm gonna work, how I'm gonna be the most effective as I go through that treatment room and get the most out of my time, you know, get the most out of my movement. And that's where hospitality workers come in. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Yeah, the episode that we did with Peter Brown from Cara Veterinary, episode 195, he was struggling to find workers. And he's like, oh, we're going to take hospitality workers in. We're going to train them to work in the veterinary industry. And he said that it's just been unbelievable. They, they've won. They've filled a lot of the shortages that they were having. And so if people are listening to this episode and they haven't listened to the other one, what would you tell our listeners that are out there struggling to find staff when it comes to thinking about maybe taking some hospitality workers into their veterinary hospital? I think one of the challenges that people perceive they have is these are not medical people. They're not trained. I will have to start from scratch. But if you're looking at bringing in a CSR from the hospitality, sure, you're going to have to train them about routine care, vaccinations, triage over the phone. But the basic skills that matter the most at the front desk are making connections with people and making sure that they feel comfortable and that they are uh, you're using active listening skills. So you can train people to do the work, the task, if they have the interest, the motivation and the attitude. You know, you could hire people with great attitudes and you can train them to do anything. And I certainly have in the past. Um, but. I've had people who work for me at the front desk who came from retail sales, who were like the manager of a dry cleaner, who worked at, you know, restaurants and doing hospitality work, bartenders, um, you know, and bartenders can manage drunks. So bartenders can manage anything. And they're very good at the front desk. Um, I've had the least success with school teachers because school teachers like to be in control and they like to have an orderly lesson plan. And there is no lesson plan at the front desk of an animal hospital. It's a free for all up there some days. But um, it is really having that mindset adaptable. Um, I was speaking with Eleanor Green at the veterinary partners meeting, and she said one of the things that we look at in the profession and people are, are the most successful in veterinary medicine are the ones who are adaptable. And I feel like that's where hospitality comes in because there's so many variables that happen in a restaurant, in a hotel, in a bar that the people who work there are instantly able to problem solve and find a solution. And that's what we need. We need problem solvers. It's so interesting that, you know, you never hear, and maybe because we're not in other professions, but I don't know if there's any other profession where people say, you know, where it's great to hire people from, from veterinary hospital. And that's a bit of a shame because I think that, <laughs> it's we're not good communicators like we're looking for other industries which is sad because we have people that are passionate about the pet care but unfortunately for some reason it brings with it the lowest eq which has been documented in our <laughs> profession is not a good customer service mm -hmm. so it's it's just kind of you know sad for me to see that that there's no one goes and says hey you know what if you want to hire an amazing communicator or amazing people person look in the veterinary hospitals no one says that yeah. <laughs> it's interesting it's interesting we're hiring a bunch of people at my software company from the veterinary community because we need people to help with medical record verification ivan and it's it's fascinating because the people that we've hired are amazing. The one thing that I would say about the veterinary industry is like if you want to if you want to be surrounded by people that understand how to work, like understand how to like put a 10 hour or 12 hour day in and you know just work work work, the people from the veterinary industry have just blown my mind away as we kind of integrate them into our team. So I think there is 
you know, positives as well as negatives. Uh, I just want to defend our community a little bit. Well, thank you for doing that. <laughs> and Debbie, then, then my question is, do you think that hospitality skills in the sort of the vet assistant roles is also useful? And do you think that, I'm just kind of, you know, as you were talking about this, I'm envisioning, okay, for our hospitals, we have a big problem hiring actually CSRs in one of our hospitals. And then also in another one, we have big trouble hiring the animal assistants or attendants that, you know, this is a fast churn sort of, position. And uh, I was just wondering that if, would it be enticing to people in hospitality? Let's say I go to a restaurant, I have a great experience and I'm thinking, boy, would I want to bring this person to work on my team? Would it, would it be a match to actually bring the person and, and cons in consideration of pay as well? Like, is it matching what they're earning in one space to basically, as you are having a great meal and tipping them, you know, slide your business card and be like, hey, did you ever think about working with animals? Is that equitable, like between the professions and which yeah, I, one? Would you know, be I think that it is 100% equitable that you could have someone who was a good server that would work well in the front or the back of the hospital. Um, these are skills that are translatable. And you know, to go back to your point about the people that we have in vet med, what we have is a lot of intellectual introverts. Yes. That work in, in animal hospital. But that but they're very, very intelligent people. And the challenge is that they just haven't been trained. So once they are trained and once they learn these skills, they absolutely have the ability to use them. It's the challenge that we have is we don't do a very good job of training them. Right. And if you think about working with a veterinary assistant or a veterinary technician, they go into the exam rooms and they're the ones who are usually presenting the treatment plan. They have to have good people skills to read that client and see points of confusion. They have to be able to basically sell what they're offering uh, and to show the benefit to the pet, show the benefit to the owner. And those are not skills that any of us ever were trained in our curriculums in veterinary medicine. In fact, if I was in a room of veterinarians and I said, I'm going to teach you sales skills, can you imagine the reaction? I mean, oh, I would just faint. Like, over. I'm a scientist. I'm not a salesperson. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> but the, the problem comes, and you know, that's just a mindset. If you think about the biggest challenges that we've had economically in the country, that's when things stop selling. So sales is of a benefit. And when we look at sales as this is just an enlightenment. I am educating you to a tool that you don't even know you need, but it's going to make your life better because nobody wants to live with a dog that has chronically licking its feet and keeps you up all night hearing ch 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 chewing going on. So I have a problem. You have a problem. I have a solution, but I have to sell you the solution in a way that makes you see that it does solve your problem. And that's where this communication training comes in. And we talk about that a lot in the book because we we don't do that for people. And then we expect to have good results when we're not utilizing known tools that are out there in the sales community or in retail or in hospitality. How many times do you get offered dessert after a meal? That's an upsell. Those are things that we need to be teaching our teams. And so they do translate. Yeah, absolutely agree. And I like, so I'm working shout out to my uh, friend from Australia, uh, Dr. Gerardo Poli, and he has the training that he created and they, they don't call it sales. And I think that that actually sounds much better for the vets. They talk about how to articulate the value in the exam room, mm -hmm. because essentially what, when you are in the sales process, you really are trying to articulate the value of something to another person. Mm -hmm. If they understand the value of what is provide it to them, then they're willing to pay for it, which is essentially sales. But if we need to dress it up for the right. veterinarian, yeah. that's for articulation of value. So is that, can we use your book then uh, to recommend it here, of course, as the guide to how to train? Can we just, you know, someone who doesn't know, where do we start with the training? Can right. we just say, yeah. well, get the book, get the uh, the hospitality and healthcare and start giving that as a starting point when you hire someone. Yeah. Would that be a helpful kind of a starting point for anybody on the front desk or in the back or anybody it, um, in the hospital? It would, it would be helpful for, for anybody in the hospital. And the way the book is written, it has exercises that go with the chapters. Because I feel like a lot of times we, we do training, and I'm using the air bunny quotes, we do training, but it doesn't stick with us because we just – we go through it and we learn it enough to regurgitate it, but it's not very sticky. 
So the idea behind the exercises in here are to make people personalize it. So for example, if I'm talking about prejudging whether a client will spend money or not, I'm going to say, I want you to think about a time when you prejudged someone and they surprised you and they whipped out a credit card and said, do whatever it need, you need for my animal. Even though you looked at them and said, oh, these people will never spend any money. And we've all done it because that's how human beings are. We are judgmental, but we have to understand why our mind is doing that. We, we have these biases that we are utilizing to get through life. There's just brain shortcuts but they're often very, very wrong. And so when we learn some emotional intelligence, we learn to stop those biases and go, no, wait a minute. I don't know. I have no idea how to x-ray this person's wallet. So let me offer the best that I can and let me present it in a way that they understand the value of it and how it's going to benefit their lives and their pets' lives. One of the parts of the book, I think that we don't do very well in veterinary medicine is understanding who the hero of the story is. Because the veterinarians and the veterinary teams think it's them. And they think we're coming here to save animals. And that's why I went to school is to, to save animals. The client is the hero of the story. We are the wise counselor that supports the client. And the patient usually is the dilemma. Because in every great story, there is the hero, there is the dilemma, and there's the counselor that comes and helps guide them through to the happy ending or the outcome that's desired. So when we start to look at our position as the counselor, then I think it changes that mindset to a more hospitable mindset that says, I'm just here to help. I'm here to guide. I'm here to support. I'm here to show empathy. I'm here to walk with you and not push you in the direction I want you to go. We're a team. Yeah, that makes tons of sense. Debbie, what was the inspiration for the book? Like, is this something you've been thinking about for a while oh. or did this just kind of come out of your life's work? What, what, well, what made you write the book? I had been thinking about it for years, quite honestly. And I had a conversation one day with Brenda Andreessen and I said, this book has been in my head. I just can't make myself sit down and do it. And two weeks later, she called me back and she said, hey, Care Credit would like to help you by sponsoring the writing of this book. Would you be interested and could you get it done? before the next AVMA. And I'm like, hmm, sure, yes, I can do that. Because, I, you know, it was a time that I had the opportunity. I had been the president of Vet Partners. I had rolled off of that. And uh, my responsibilities to that had reduced. And so it was just a really good time for me to, to do it. But it had been in my head and had been, these are things that I have taught for years and years and years. And so this is the culmination of that. Now, the other thing that I did in this book was I straddled it across human and veterinary medicine because I'm also a cancer survivor and I have been in the, on the other side of the exam table as a patient. And I look at it as an administrator. So I, I, the manager head sees what needs to be done in practice. The hospitality part of me sees how to make the patient experience better. And the experiences I live through as a patient, good and bad, I share in the book too, because I feel like a lot of times when we can personalize how it feels to be the patient, we also can personalize how it feels to be the client and be in that world of the unknown where people are speaking a language we don't understand, where they're tearing, telling us very scary things about what could go on with us and how we have to trust that team. And in, as a human patient, you know, I was a cancer survivor. You're trusting them so that you live. And so in veterinary medicine, they're trusting us with something equally valuable to them. And that is their pet because this is their family. And so we have to understand the, the importance of that experience for them. And we have to make the experience so positive that they want to listen to us and that we are not adversarial because that's, it feels like sometimes that is what happens is we become adversaries. Mm, absolutely. Well, there it is. Uh, Hospitality and Healthcare. This is a book that is available on all major booksellers, so highly recommended. But Debbie, in terms of the book that you would recommend, aside from yours, is there a book, TED Talk, YouTube video, or anything else that you would like our listeners to check out? My number one recommended book of all times is always Crucial Conversations. That oh. one is it. And then there is a great TED Talk. The guy's name is... Um, Will Gadera, and he talks about exceptional customer service. It's a, it's a great story that he tells about serving a hot dog in his five-star Michelin-rated restaurant because some of his customers 
we're going to miss out on that New York experience. And he went outside and got a street vendor hot dog and plated it and served it to them because he overheard the conversation that they didn't want to miss the hot dog experience. So since then, he has he has talked about and created these over the top exceptional um, customer service experiences for his customers. And there's a whole conference about it. So, yeah, that one is a good one, too. That's awesome, Debbie. Well, thanks so much for being here. The last question for you, Debbie, is another innovator, somebody you think that we should have as a guest on the show. Um, I would think that you could talk to Andrea Crabtree. Andrea is a practice management consultant. She is excellent at operations and pulling in different kinds of technologies to make operations flow smoothly. And I think she'd be a great guest. Thank you so much for listening to the Veterinary Innovation Podcast. If you want to hear about our new episodes, please follow us on any social media channel. Also, you can check out our website at veterinaryinnovationpodcast.com. See you next week.